7.01 now, so I just, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Bill Hopkins, and it's my great pleasure today to be able to introduce our speaker for the evening, which is uh, Rich, Ricky Linux. And uh, uh, Ricky has, some of you, if you're, if you're in the North Texas area, for sure, you know who Ricky is because he has spoken at a lot of, uh, he's a very popular speaker at all of our various chapter meetings uh, around uh, North Texas, and I guess he gets down into some of Central Texas, and I don't know if he ever gets to the South Texas area or not. And of course, uh, a lot of us know uh, Ricky uh, because of his book, too. Uh, his, uh, his very interesting book that he put out uh, a few years ago, and I, I think it might still be in print. Or no, it's, is it, there may be a few copies. I don't know if there's a new, uh, is there a new edition, Ricky? Uh, it's at the end of the fourth printing right now, and there's okay. a few copies still in some of the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District offices. Britt still has copies. Good. Okay, so uh, it's still available uh, out there, and it's, a, it's we all know that it's a, a wonderful resource to have available to identify and uh, plants and grasses in the North Texas area, and it's also a great thing because it tells you how, what the value of the plants are as well, which is something that you don't often see in plant ID books. Uh, Ricky was a, uh, uh, with the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Services for something like 38 years as a uh, wildlife biologist, and he retired in January of this year. Uh, Ricky has been a uh, president of the Cross Timbers chapter in the past, I think for two years, if I'm not mistaken. And he also served on our state board as a vice president uh, for a while back a few years ago. And now what we're really excited to, uh, that Ricky is going to become the president elect in a few days. And from that, he will be uh, soon be president after uh, Linda term is over. So we're really excited about having Ricky on board in that capacity. So I'm sure Ricky has a great presentation uh, for us today. And so I'm going to stop uh, talking and let Ricky go ahead and share his screen and get started. All right, Bill. Well, thank you. Thanks to everyone. Um, this is uh, quite an honor to be uh, president-elect. Hope I can do as good a job as the ones that have come before us. Uh, we'll give it the best we can. Uh, appreciate Kim for asking me to give this presentation on celebrating community and conservation. And we have to ask how native plants and Nipsot are they still relevant in our daily lives? And I think they are def definitely so. We're going to see as we go through this PowerPoint how, uh, how they are so important. Now, I was supposed to be this week at an event called Kids on the Land. And if I had been there, I would have been sitting right at this seat right here where this bowl of popcorn is with my laptop instead of the popcorn. Now, this is the Lamb's Head Ranch, which is in Throckmorton and a little bit into uh, Shackford County, a little over 50,000 acres, been in existence since the 1860s in the same family, same, uh, all the heirs now have maintained it as a unit. And Kids on the Land is a neat event that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. I'll, I also want to show you this, this building uh, was built, this cook shack was built in 1923. And this is a photo from 2019 that you see here on the right. Uh, this photo from the 1960s, here is the south part of the building. Uh, the door was in the middle then, but notice now there's a fireplace. The door has been moved over here to the right. But if you look at this picnic table right here, that's the same picnic table that's right there. So this ranch maintains a lot of history. It's a great uh, opportunity to go on that ranch and visit. 
it, right behind me is where the cowboys sit, a big round table and a big, even bigger fireplace there that they fire up with a lot of mesquite wood in the, uh, in the wintertime. Here's a view outside uh, part of the bunkhouses built in the 1960s, I believe, uh, rebuilt. And this is the house where Watt Matthews, he was born on the ranch in 1899, passed away in 1997, lived to be 98 years old, only left the ranch for four years to attend Princeton University, where he graduated in the 1920s. And he was uh, uh, a visionary, I guess, of, of how to take care of the land. And he took care of that ranch, too. So we'll get to see uh, some of the things in this uh, presentation. Here's a photo from a book cover from one of the many books that's been written about the Lamb's Head Ranch. Uh, and that's a photo of Watt. And this ranch house back here is known as the Old Stone Ranch House. And it was in ruins. And in the, uh, I believe it was the 1960s, Watt had that reconstructed. Uh, you were look, you're looking at the back side now. This is Walnut Creek right here. Now we're going to jump on the other side of the building. And here's the front side. And these walls are two foot thick, you know, great protection from uh, attacks by anyone that might be wanting to attack them in the 1850s. Uh, in fact, this, uh, they put a marker right here above the door right there uh, when it was reconstructed and carved the date of 1856. So there's there's history all in this area. And I've, I've certainly enjoyed the opportunity to get to go out there with kids on the land. So what is kids on the land? Well, these two ladies right here, lifelong friends, Catherine Dixon on the left, Peggy Maddox on the right. And Peggy is the one who originated the idea of kids on the land. She's a retired school teacher and didn't retire from conservation teaching after she retired from being a teacher. Uh, this Kids on the Land is a STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics program that's taught to school kids that are brought out to the ranches. And there's five ranches. Catherine Dixon's ranch, the 69 ranch in Nolan County is one of the five. And these, the lamb's head is the last one in the year, which we would have been having to get this year, but with COVID still going on, they decided to be safer to postpone it. But this is uh, the event that I would have been broadcasting from Lamb's Head if, if it had happened. Now, here are some of the uh, teaching points. Uh, there's, it, it originated with the Albany schools, and then the Throckmorton schools joined in, and then a smaller school district called Woodson joined. And on third grade, they, we have insect day. And the volunteers usually stay for the entire week. So we're there for three days. We get there a day early to uh, review and get prepped and everything for the kids on the land. And you can see a lot of different events going on. Each day, the, the, usually there's a group uh, activity at the start to get everyone in the mood to be studying about nature. Uh, then it's the kids are broken up into four groups and they rotate among four different stations where they learn these different, uh, you know, the insects on footprints on the land, more of a plant-based day. And then the fifth and sixth graders have a combined soil, soil critters and more day. And this is, you know, it's a fast pace. They bring their lunch, they ride their school buses out there. And it is a, a fun event. I want to introduce now changing gears just a little bit. I got to set this up for you. Uh, Mary Sophie Young was the second female botanist to come to Texas. She worked at the University of Texas, set up the new herbarium at UT. And this is actually an era. She was about 38 or 39 years old because she was born um, 1872. So they've got the date off by about 10 years here. So look at, look at the um, period dress she's wearing in the early 1900s from out in the Big Bend. She had two burros that would haul the wagon of supplies around. Uh, big hat, protector from the sun, long sleeve shirt, light colored denim skirt, 
gloves, Brogan shoes. And now I want to introduce to you Peggy Maddox channeling her inner Mary Sophie Young. And Mary Sophie Young comes and visits the kids on the land. She's got her vasculum there on her side. Uh, she, she, now normally they wouldn't leave the plants hanging out. She's doing that for, you know, display and to get the kids excited about seeing things. But if you will uh, indulge me for just a little bit, this is a 12 minute video of Mary Sophie Young uh, coming to see kids on the land. So here we go. Now you may want to turn your volume up pretty loud. I'm not going to be narrating during this. You can hear pretty good if your volume is up. So I've got the volume maxed out on my end. I'd sit around the campfire and I'd make my drawings and my writings in my journal. And I would love for you to learn how to use a journal today. Now, over 150 years ago when those naturalists, like that fella, she said she showed you a timeline see a naturalist in your timeline? Yes, ma'am. Well, when he was out here going across the prairie making collections, he was a, the explorer of his time because he was far from civilization. He was out here on the frontier. They're kind of like what you call astronauts today that want to go to the Mars, you know. They want to get out far into space, and they're out there learning because they're <coughs> curious and they're lifelong to learn. So today, I want you to be a naturalist, and I want to use all the tools you brought with you. Who, who brought some tools with them today? Oh my. Well, you did. You brought your senses. Did you bring your eyes? I want you looking and observing closely. Did you bring your nose? You can be smelling. You got hands. You can be touching got ears, you can be listening. I want you to become a part of nature. Now, to do that, we're going to do it like they did 150 years ago. There were no iPhones. There were no digital cameras. 
So we're going to be creating our naturalist journal just like they did. You're going to be collecting specimens, you're going to have a journal, you're going to be writing, and you know what else? You're not going to have to worry about an Indian attack. <laughs> like those journalists, those naturalists did when they were working out here on the plains. I didn't have to worry about it today. But you're going to have to use your sense of color and shape when you make those drawings. And I've also arranged, where's that Ricky guy? Ricky guy. Yeah. I left him in charge of finding us a trail for you to walk so you can learn about the native plants. And you know what he did? He planted down here where there are 250 heifers. <laughs>
striped shirt? How about you then? So that's kicking off fourth grade day, kids on the land, great event. Uh, a lot of those kids, well, they're all from a rural area, but some of them live in town. They don't all know the plants that are out there, you know, like a lot of kids don't these days. So we've got to educate the youth. And this program does a great job. Uh, the ones that are there, third grade, we get to see them the next year when they come back and they're fourth graders and they're studying something different this year and they remember what they studied the year before. And as we go around the state, I'll show you a view here from Elephant Mountain, south of Alpine. If you look across enough of those mountains, you're looking into Mexico. But we need rangelands. We need native forest. We need prairies and the plains. Uh, we need food. Some of this is very important for our economy. Our uh, Texas was built on the backs of longhorn cattle and rangelands. So we need uh, these wide open spaces. We need to be productive and managing and be good stewards of these lands. Uh, one of the things that we got to do on a trip, the NRCS biologists were invited to come out to uh, Elephant Mountain. Here's one of our biologists from San Angelo. He's looking over here and he's getting to see a close up of what a lot of people like to see, the very rare uh, Texas or desert bighorn sheep. Uh, once killed out, disease, 
when the sheep were introduced in the mountains, they were not, uh, they couldn't handle some of the diseases that the sheep brought, but they've been reestablished from other wild herds and other states brought into Texas. And now they've got a good population uh, enough to where they have a huntable population, which is a very good fundraiser for parks and wildlife. And, uh, you know, we need to work to better utilize our land and take care of it. As we go across uh, a little bit east of there, we go into the Edwards Plateau, and I'm just going to hit around some of the different regions, not all of the vegetational regions. But this is one of the most beautiful creeks I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of creeks through the years. This is in uh, Lano County, Honey Creek. Uh, look at the diversity of plants that you can see in this photo, and including one right here called bog hemp that's not very common. But it's just a great, beautiful spot that the people that own this land take care of it. They value it for its beauty. And this pays dividends downstream. The people get cleaner water, clearer water, and less sediment, less pollutants, because this, this creek and the vegetation are able to filter that out. Also there on the creek, uh, flowering plants in the spring. We've got hog plum here with this red admiral nectaring on the flowers. So not all uh, pollinators visit strictly wildflowers. Think about the woody plants too. We need to be managing for those. If we go down into deep South Texas, Hebronville, pretty far down there in South Texas, uh, all of the light colored vegetation that you see right here is Texas croton. It is a valuable croton for bobwhite quail, scale quail. And this country is just pretty good quail country. It always has been. Here's a group of adults. They, most of them own land, own ranches. Uh, all of them want to have more quail and they're attending a program called Quail Masters where they go around the state visiting different regions, different ranches that, that are managing for quail. And here we are in May of 2017 down there. We went back and uh, went on a different part of that ranch and look at the uh, little blue stem, the vegetative cover that's out here, the woody structure. Uh, this woody structure, low woody plants needs to be about a softball throw apart, uh, just as far as you can throw a softball for quail to be able to fly and escape a predator and then land and get into that woody cover. If they get spooked out of here, they can fly over to this one, just keep going. So this is very good quail habitat. It takes management though, to keep it this way. And it takes plants like this, uh, prickly poppy to feed the quail. And we can't forget the smallest wildlife managers in Texas are the pollinators. It's not the guy in the cowboy hat that drives a four, four wheel drive pickup. It's not the wildlife manager, it's these pollinators that are pollinating the plants, keeping these plants active and growing and you know, new seeds and new plants. Otherwise we'd be out of the wildlife business. You get over into East Texas, lots of pine trees, oak trees, but if you get over uh, into some of these seepy bogs, here's a pitcher plant bog. And I had on my uh, rubber boots, and they, I nearly sank down to the top of those rubber boots. Uh, also, uh, the associated sundews would be found right there in that pitcher plant bog. If we come back into the Rolling Plains, Lamb's Head Ranch, uh, we didn't have one last year, but I was missing Lamb's Head so much, I called and got permission to come out there, spent the day riding around, taking photos, reading the land, looking at it, they're still doing a lot of uh, brush management to fight back the mesquite in this on this ranch. And you can see the you know dividends that are being paid. Good grass, good forb production, Maximilian sunflower, all those yellow patches you see. In October, the monarchs are coming through. To the monarchs, this is like you know, seeing a Bucky's gas station with all those gas pumps. They're coming down and filling up their gas tank with nectar. So we need these native plants. They are very relevant in our life. Another pasture on lamb's head, all of this white flower. What is that? Same time of year that it's flowering and heath aster benefits 
local honeybees as well as the monarchs that come down to nectar on these flowering plants, just again, trying to fill up that gas tank. And you can see heath aster is very common across uh, nearly all the vegetational regions, maybe a little spotty in the piney woods of South Texas, but it's common in Texas. And here we are back in 2012, the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch was holding a field day and Dale Rollins right here in the middle is a quail biologist extraordinaire. And he is holding up a broomweed and he has asked everyone else to grab a broomweed, hold it up, and he's leading the Pledge of Allegiance to Broomweed. And you'll have to hear it someday. Maybe you'll hear it from him. But it's uh, a plant that quail dearly love to eat the seeds of. It gives them excellent cover when it's green and growing like that. So broomweed is a nice plant common across the, you know, most of the state. We're in the rolling plains here between Snyder and uh, Roby. We move on up into the Panhandle, far north Texas, Roberts County, just one county away from the state line, the Panhandle, Oklahoma to the north. Sand sagebrush, not a lot of trees, but sand sage, uh, short grass country. Another ranch that's well managed specifically for quail, for quail hunting. They also hunt deer, they have, a, they have cattle, but it's managed to benefit quail. And here we are looking at a new plant that we had found. We weren't sure what it was. I found out that it's an annual called Rocky Mountain Bee Plant. And as you would guess by that name, it's more common into the uh, Rocky Mountain states, but it comes over as far east as Oklahoma and Nebraska, Kansas, and down into the panhandle of Texas. So excellent for pollinators and makes an excellent seed for bobwhite quail. Now, we looked at some good habitat. Here's a ranch in central Texas uh, between Mills County and Hamilton County. And this had been grazed with sheep, goats, cattle, deer, no exotics, just native white-tailed deer for 120, 25 years. Uh, the owner of the land had the land leased out when I took this photo in 2012 in March. Uh, how many wildflowers do you see in that photo? How tall is the grass in that photo? The leaser was grazing pretty hard, but the landowner enrolled this creek into, and this is the headwaters of the uh, Lampasas River, actually. The landowner enrolled it into a riparian buffer program to take it out of uh, being grazed by livestock, fenced off. They were paid a, a yearly fee to take it out of uh, grazing. And I wanna show you now six years later, this is March of 12. Look at this big rock. Look at this cut bank right here, sloughing and doesn't have a lot of vegetation. Water's running down both sides of this little island. So let's go forward to May of 2018. The grasses have recovered. Look at this cut bank over here is healing up good. There's gra good grass growth, but what's missing? Flowering. Forbes, wildflowers. That 125 year history of sheep, goat, cattle, deer, hard grazing has taken out some of the forbs. So we're gonna need to reseed. We need to be thinking about restoration on some of these pastures. So native plants, again, they're relevant and we've got to put them back where they're needed. Here's a very uh, worthwhile field trip. If you ever get to make it, I know we've had field trips there in the past with former meetings, master naturalists have had meetings, uh, field trips here. But this is a prairie in Northern Bell County um, called Burleson Prairie, named after Bob and Mickey Burleson. And here's Mickey. Uh, I was going to a NRCS meeting in Temple the morning, it was gonna be held October 25th. And I was coming in the night before and spend the night. And I called and asked if I could make a trip out to the prairie and look around, walk around, and they gave me permission. And I spent a little over an hour out there on the prairie. And what was flowering most predominantly was Maximilian sunflower. But I want, to, I want you to see some of the uh, diversity of insects and plants that we can find on these. And this is a restored prairie. This was cropland that the Burlesons restored it. And this is probably, 
40 years after, well, 35 to 40 years after it was restored. So there's hope. You know, this land will heal. It will come back if we take the trouble and do the work to help restore it. So let's look at some of the diversity. Here's a carpenter bee, uh, again on Maximilian sunflower. Uh, I love the American bumblebees, all bumblebees. I really like to look for them and try to get photos of bumblebees. Guff fritillary. Here's an Eastern carpenter bee on Leavenworth Oringo. I'm not sure about this one. I think it might be a red flower beetle. If somebody knows, put it in the chat. We'll find out what it is. Uh, black swallowtail, I think. It was so faded, it's hard to see. And some of the photos I have where you could see a grass stem behind it, you could see the grass stem through the wing leaf, wing, it was so thin. Common buckeye, this one was real skittish. I only got two photos and this was the better of the two before this one flew away and flew way away. Uh, little blue stem there in the picture as well. And then I come up on this cat. Uh, pretty late in the year for a caterpillar, I thought. And I moved in a little closer. And about that time, this bumblebee buzzed in and I got to thinking about competition between these two species. And what I found out later, it took a little researching, but this, this caterpillar is gonna turn into a salt marsh moth. Please, I believe that's what it's gonna turn into. The, the caterpillar was eating the ray petals. The um, honeybee was looking for pollen, but there is gonna be some competition there because if that caterpillar had gotten there earlier, there wouldn't have been as, uh, as healthy of a flower for that honeybee to find the pollen. There's a close up of that little caterpillar. He's just munching away. I, I would move the stem and twist it around to get a better camera angle and it never bothered him a bit. Sometimes caterpillars don't like to be messed with, but that one was hungry. Another carpenter bee and notice he's been, he's visiting a plant that one of those salt marsh caterpillars has already been to because the petals are all gone. Here's a ranch that I've helped uh, for about 11 years do uh, spotlight counts at night for white-tailed deer to determine how many deer they have. This is uh, Mills County between Gulfwaite and Comanche, Central Texas area. It's high fenced, uh, just under 800 acres. Hadn't had any livestock on it in about 12 to 14 years, but it, it does have uh, axis deer, black buck antelope, white-tailed deer. And it, when we started working with them, it, it had deer numbers that were as high as the deer numbers in Llano and Mason counties in their heydays. We're talking a deer to three acres, a deer to two and a half acres, very heavy pressure on the uh, habitat. And with uh, the, the spotlight counts, we were able to tell them how many deer they have and how many you need to harvest. And we did this yearly, uh, absentee landowners, but they needed to know how many deer to take off. And so they let us come out and do the spotlight counts. But in the, on the other hand, we got to train new NRCS employees on how to do spotlight counts. So they could go back home and if somebody asked about a count, they would know how to do these. I don't wanna call your attention, lots of KR blue stem on this ranch. The exotic animals are not eating it. Black buck antelope do eat a lot of grass, but they don't really seem to prefer KR. Here's some little blue stem. And the only flowering plant you can see right here, a little patch of gray gold aster. The deer forb wise are not living on forbs, they're living on the browse. And I wanna now go across the road. Here's the ranch road. This is the path that we'd come on our spotlight count at night. And I always went out there first and drove the route to make sure there weren't any ruts or washouts or places that we couldn't get, couldn't get around before we had a bed load of people in the back of the pickup. Well, we're gonna walk across right over here now. And I wanna call your attention to this row of trees. These are live oaks that have died. Live oak wilts killed them. This ranch is estimated to have lost over a thousand trees, Spanish oak and live oak to oak wilt decline, oak wilt and decline. But this little uh, area of live oaks is shaped like a cigar. It's kind of wide and long. It's about 70 yards long and about half of the trees just up and died very, very suddenly. These over here will probably die eventually. 
but I noticed there was a little patch of yellow underneath these trees. So I walked up a little closer and what was there was golden crown beard, also known as cowpin daisy, a native annual forb. A lot of farmers will call it a weed and cowpin daisy might give you a name uh, that it's gonna come up in a kind of an abandoned area or less used area, but it's a great, pollinator plant. Look at the months that it's in flower. Yes, different years, but May, July, October. As long as there's moisture, it'll stay flowering all summer long. When we have those wet years like 2007, 2015, 2016, it flowered all year long. So now I'm standing right at the breaking point between to the right, you see all this sunshine hitting the ground, that's the dead trees. To the left, you see the, the shadows, this is the living live oaks. And notice under the live oaks, Texas winter grass. Over here, I'm gonna start this video, it's pretty short, but I want you to notice that as I pan to the right, the uh, cowpin daisy came up on its own underneath those dead limbs. There were no, nobody planted these seeds. The dead roots were no longer using the moisture and the sunlight was able to hit the ground and these seeds had been in the soil for no telling how long and they just germinated, came up. It was a good, pretty good wet year in uh, the summer of 2018. So lots of uh, another example of a Bucky's service station for pollinators. Look at all those yellow flowers reflecting the autumn sunshine back up toward the butterflies. So. That was interesting to, to notice. Now I was up on top of this little hill, this mountain right here, when I took those photos or that video, I came down, the road came down off the mountain and came around and I noticed another live oak had died and there was one good size cowpin daisy under it. I got to thinking, I wonder if that'll make, make enough seed to where this will be covered up the next year. Look how green the Texas winter grass is, all of this, Silverleaf nightshade. Just look at how green it is, September of 2018. Here it is in August of 2019. Look how dry everything is. There was some cowpin daisy that germinated, only got 12, 18 inches tall and, and died. Being an annual, it, it you know had to have the moisture and didn't have the root system to hang in there. Went back and looked in 20. And again, look how dry. Uh, it's not looking good for cowpin daisy, although there was some that had come up early. It tries to come. I went back up on top of the mountain and looked. Uh, this is the area that had the cowpin daisy in 2018. But look how dry the Texas winter grass is in 2020. And the Texas winter grass is out competing. Being it's perennial, uh, it's out competing the annual cowpin daisy. So it may be several years before cowpin daisy shows up like that. And that's okay as long as on other pieces of land, we're creating those buckies, those micro uh, pollinator uh, sunshine areas where they can come down, find plants and find the nectar they need. Let's look at some conservation efforts on the horizon. This is a plant that I got excited about back in 2014. Uh, I had seen it once before on a prairie in, in Munster right, right here but I didn't know what it was. It was in the spring, it was only about 12 inches tall, didn't have any flowers on it. And I just kind of forgot to, to look it up. A couple of years later in 2014, uh, I was riding with Charlie Shear, the district conservationist of the NRCS field office in Knox City. And we were up on top of uh, these old rough hills going to look at some brushwork that had been done, some cedar that had been pushed and area reseeded. And we were on top of the a little hill uh, on the, where the road was and we saw this flowering in August and I said, Charlie, stop, we've got to get out and see what this is. So we get out and here's Knox County. But if you look at this plant, willow leaf sunflower is mainly a plant of the Great Plains. It goes well on up into Nebraska, um, South Dakota, but here's Oklahoma has a few counties. Texas has only five counties where it's known to be. And we, we're here in Knox County where it's never been found before. So we got, uh, got to looking, took another photo uh, before we dropped off this hill. There's Charlie Shear, look off the edge here. And this is a very tight soil called a Knocko Badlands Complex. 
it, it, if you dig a dig down a shovel full of clay and get down to some that's six inches or so below the surface, you'll pull up a clod of it like, and it'll be like a bar of soap. You could take a knife and shave that clay in little layers. It's such a dense clay. It sheds water like a like the top of a table. It's not going to soak in much water. This is a west facing facing slope. So tremendous, you know, adversaries of trying to get this plant to grow and where it's wanting to grow, but it's growing and it's on its own. Now, right over here, this road went on down, went around and came back right through here. And we got down to that spot right there and there was some more, but look how big and robust this is. This is down in that bottom land and this is a mangum clay, another deep clay, but not as harsh conditions. Water actually kind of soaks into this soil uh, because of the flatness of the land right here. But we, we collected seed of this plant. This is on another ranch. We collected seed for several years. That's a five gallon bucket right there. And this plant all the way up here to the top is about nine feet tall right there. It's a tall plant, kind of rowdy looking. Uh, we had to wait till no past Thanksgiving actually to harvest the seed because it was flowering well right till frost and even still the seed wasn't mature after uh, frost. We had to wait till after Thanksgiving. So in this deeper clay, seven to nine foot deep over here, this is in Cook County. And this is on a soil called Malatira Lido. And it is known as a uh, shallow soil, about five inches of brown, chocolatey brown, loam soil over fractured limestone. That's what we're seeing right here. And the plants don't get as tall, maybe four to six feet tall. But we've also found it on these other loam soils, clay loams, uh, all of these different soils it's been growing on. So that's important because as we, if this plant can get to become where it's commercially available, now it will be adapted to growing on different soils, different counties, different regions of the state. And we've got a new pollinator plant that's flowering in the fall and deer will eat on this plant too. So here's a close up of the flower, yellow petals, uh, brown, this flower is a perennial sunflower, much like Maximilian sunflower. Here's the American bumblebee in that same, uh, if that's a flower beetle, I'm not sure, but I think it's the same beetle right there. And then here's the leaves. It gets the name willow leaf from these long willow shaped, like a willow tree shaped leaves. And so here's where uh, I first saw it, didn't know what it was in Cook County. Here we collected it in um, Knox County, went back and collected it in Cook County. A friend of mine, Max Slagle, who was working in the Cook County uh, NRCS office, was actually dove hunting in Grayson County and saw it growing on the roadside. And he got permission to collect it. He collected some in Grayson County. I found it growing down in Wise County on several different soils. And then Mary Curry heard about this collection. And she called me and we, we got in touch and I went up there and met her and she showed me some places and we collected it in Montague County. So in three of the counties it was known from, we found it. I doubt it's in Dallas County anymore, probably because there's just not enough prairies left. It would be interesting to know if anyone has ever seen it in Dallas County. And down here in Hill County, that's probably been plowed up and put into cotton or wheat and probably not available there. But we found it in three of the counties and found it in two new counties. So what's gonna happen with this? Well, the Bud Smith Knox City Plant Material Center in Knox City County is going, uh, they've had it under test. They planted it in rows back in 2017. Photos on the right I got today from Brandon Carr, the manager of the Plant Material Center. And look how robust, now it's wild and woolly. It's not gonna be a tame little backyard, uh, put, it, put it there next to your uh, sidewalk. It's a rowdy, robust plant. And it spreads by rhizomes, makes the, the plant base gets larger over time. But again, flowering in the fall, when we need something for these, uh, you know, we have spring flowers, summer flowers and fall flowers. We need more in the fall flower range. And this one's got promise. 
So hopefully they started out with 50 collections that we made in those five counties. And Brandon said about 20 of the collections have fallen out. The plants died. They didn't, didn't stand through a drought or they weren't leafy enough. And so they're winnowing these down. Whichever ones show off the best and, and have the most leaf, the most flower, earliest flowering period, latest flower, those will be put into um, probably final trials and they will be a, a maybe a conglomerate of several plants put together. So you've got a diversity of the uh, origins of the seeds and those will be sent to seed growers who will then take them and grow them and then make them commercially available to places like Turner Seed Company, Barmert Seed Company, uh, Douglas King Seed Company, or wherever you buy your seed, you'll be able to buy this plant, hopefully five to 10 years, if not sooner. And all of the plant sales that are going on now, this was our, my own bill in my own chapter, Cross Timbers chapter, uh, their spring 2019 plant sale. You got to keep these plants moving. People want to know about these plants. They want to plant them. And I was fortunate September 25th to go down to Williamson County and uh, witness their plant sale. Great event, lots of people, lots of volunteers. A lot of people wanting to buy plants, waiting in line. They had this table full of plants, plus about seven more, plus plants on the outside. So they had tremendous support and a great plant sale and a great event. They've got a lot of great workers as well as the cross timber chapters. And I'm sure every chapter that has plant sales, nature centers that have plant sales are doing great business because people are wanting to know about the natives. And it's up to the Native Plant Society of Texas to help keep these natives in a forefront and keep people aware, make them aware of these plants. So it doesn't matter if you're managing, and I hate to say that that Hereford bull is standing in KR blue stem, but on the Lamb's Head Ranch, the only place we see KR is in a band about five to 10 feet wide on, on the county or ranch roads. And there are some of these roads. In fact, this is a county road that I'm on here. So the seed gets brought in from other vehicles, but it doesn't matter if you're managing for uh, bulls, cows, whitetail bucks, or any kind of wildlife, the butterflies, the bees, native bees, native bumblebees, even the honeybee, it takes plants. And hopefully we can keep the native plants going. Uh, this little sweat bee is pretty tiny. Look how small that flower of Texas nightshade is. That's my hand in the photo. And that's a pretty small bee. This American bumblebee over here, pretty good size. He's an, over an inch long. Michael Warner, who used to be with Parks and Wildlife as a, a bumblebee specialist, now works with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, once said that only the female bumblebees will sting. So you got a 50-50 chance of picking one up and not getting stung, just in case you want to try it out. Just, just saying. And let's don't forget about the dung beetles, the ones that reincorporate the waste from the livestock, put it back into the soil uh, where it can be used again to grow more plants and keep Texas healthy. We wanna keep Texas looking like Texas. We don't wanna have a lot of invasive introduced plants come in. So keep Texas looking like Texas. I'm, I'm not sure, Lady Bird Johnson may have been the first one to say it that way. Uh, those of you around the Abilene area, the big country master naturalist. We got some crossovers who are also Native Plant Society members. You know this gentleman, Rob Haley. He is a Vietnam War veteran, a Green Beret in the Vietnam War, but just the nicest fellow as you'd ever want to meet. He has a ranch between Abilene and Albany, and he's a one-man show. He does all the work on that ranch himself. And he was a Lone Star Land Steward recipient from Parks and Wildlife a few years ago. And um, I'm showing him this plant right here, the Leavenworth Oringo, the seeds, once these mature, he's got a magnifier looking at the seeds. The seeds are very unique. Under magnification, look at them. They've got little white straws coming off the back of the seed, like a prehistoric dinosaur seed almost. Uh, and what's interesting, mother nature takes care of the quail and songbirds. But these seeds normally don't start dropping out of the Leavenworth Oringo until late January or February, 
when most of the native seeds that they like to eat, the sunflower, the croton, the ragweed, most of them have already been eaten by February or they've been covered up in the vegetation or in mud. And now these fresh seeds are falling on the ground, these white seeds that they can easily spot on the ground. Look in the background, there's been some brush pushing done, probably some rain seeding, hopefully with grasses and forbs, wildflowers. And this gentleman's looking down, he's gotten out of the pickup. He's reading the land and noticed that, hey, there's something over here I gotta go see. So he got out of the truck and there's new plants growing where maybe they couldn't grow before because they were shaded out by the juniper. And you got to ask, how well do you understand your land? Reading the land is a valuable trait to learn, and you learn it by observation, time spent outdoors. So I encourage all of you to get out as much as you can. These virtual field trips are great. You get to see a different part of the state than maybe where you live. I encourage you to tune in to those. And this gentleman down in Central Texas, another hardworking individual, uh, hard work and an understanding of nature and the use of native plants leads to successful ranching, wildlife management, if that's what you're doing, land restoration, building pollinator habitat. Maybe you're getting into ecotourism. Well, people want to see native Texas plants. They want to see the real Texas, not the introduced stuff. And maybe you're working on micro prairies, maybe a backyard micro prairie, or maybe a 20 acre prairie. All of this works toward a healthy earth. And we've got to make connection with the native plants. Uh, they are relevant to our lives. They're relevant to the Native Plant Society. And it doesn't matter if it's a 50 something thousand acre ranch like Lamb's Head, or if it's your backyard. You can do things to improve your backyard and ranchers can do things to improve the land they manage. And we all need to be better stewards of the land. Take care of the land, keep Texas looking like Texas. And with that, Bill, I'll stop uh, sharing and see if we've got any, any questions. Ricky, we do have a question. Uh, some of the people are wondering about uh, the willow leaf sunflower seeds, if they're there's any possibility that they could be made available to people, to growers who are just starting out like themselves? Uh, I don't know. I can check with Brandon Carr at Knox City and see if there might be a way, um, a way we could get some. I'll have to check with that. I'll, I'll check with him. Well, I have another question about the kids on the prairie uh, thing. Okay. Uh, what, um, what, is there a way that uh, people, other other kids can, and, and other places nearby can get involved in that program? Well, I think you'll have to go to uh, Peggy Maddox at kidsontheland.org and, and ask for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if they're maxed out on the number of schools that they've got with five different locations going on different times of the year. Um, I'm sure they're adults. If you, um, They're always looking for volunteers. So if you wanted to come and help out, I think you could. I don't know about bringing other kids. I don't think there'd be any harm to it, but they would need to know ahead of time and you know all of that would need to be cleared out. But it might be possible. Check with Peggy Maddox. All right. And, and here's something that I've been wondering about. Uh, the thing that she was carrying there, the, she called it a vasculum. Could you tell us what that is and how that worked? Well, from the early, uh, probably the late 1700s into the 1800s up until about 1950, this was a common way that botanists would carry plants collected out in the field. And that's a very small one. It's only about 12 inches wide. And she told me she, when she was developing this, I'd given her some information on Mary Sophie Young and she came up with this idea. And she said, but I need a vasculum. And I said, well, maybe I could take a piece of stove pipe and make you one. And I got to thinking, I said, it's gonna be hard to put the ends on there and then cut a door in it. And I got to looking on eBay and they had some on there and they were longer. They would be 24 inches, 30 inches long and they'd be $200, $250. 
And one time I happened to look on eBay and there was a small one, this one that she's carrying on eBay. It had a starting price. It was either 59 or $69. I said, Peggy, you need to you know, bid on that one. And she did bid. She was the only person that bid, maybe because it was so small, no one else wanted it. But she won that one. So that's an authentic, uh, primitive, vasculum. Most of them had uh, impressions. They would take the metal and put uh, a, a die against it to maybe put a uh, little, in Germany, they would have little kids in, the fo in that impression. Uh, they would paint them sometimes with uh, paint. But the way they worked is you would put moss or leaves or newspaper inside it, wet it, and then put the plants in there. And that moisture created humidity and it would help keep the plants uh, fresh. Now, the bad thing was you, you got a piece of metal out there in the sun that's heating up. So they had to try to keep them in the shade as much as they could. But these were used widely uh, throughout the 1800s and early 1900s until people figured out that maybe an igloo ice chest would work just as good and you could put more plants in it, put it in the bed of the pickup and haul more plants back, back to wherever you wanted to research them. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, Ricky, I had some questions that came directly to me. I guess Bill can't see them. So could I just throw them in here real quick? You bet. Okay. Uh, they're all from Sarah Jenkins. She had three questions. One was about back when you were talking about the ranch <clears throat> that had the mesquite. She wanted to know how the ranch fought the mesquite. And if well, someone wanted to join the quail management group, how would they do that? Okay. Uh, Mesquite is a native. We all know that. Uh, yes. It wasn't brought in from Mexico with the cattle drives. It's native. But because of the lack of wildfires and the lack of prescribed burning on our rangelands that kept the mesquite down in the 1800s and early, early days, mesquite has flourished. Same way juniper has encroached. So the way they're doing it now is uh, with a a piece of equipment called a track hoe. It's like a huge backhoe and it has an arm that can reach out and it roots up the root of the mesquite. And that operator can sit in one spot and swing about a 30 foot circle all the way around in a circle. It's a lot easier on the operator than having to drive that bulldozer bumping and, you know, toward every plant. But they root it out of the ground and then they take another piece of equipment that is a uh, uh, it's got a rake on the front of a four-wheel drive uh, rubber tired front end loader and they can real quickly race through and, and scratch along the surface of the ground which creates a seed bed and they're raking up that brush into piles and they'll burn those piles and then they come back and either airily apply seed or come back with uh, ground uh, rigs to put wild uh, grass seed and forb seeds out. And she had a, a related question uh, about brush pushing. She wanted to know what that was. I'm assuming that's well, just knocking the brush over, right? Well, it, with mesquite, you've got and and redberry juniper in the hill country. You got blueberry juniper, but in the uh, rolling plains and the panhandle, it's redberry juniper. So those mesquite and redberry juniper are both sprouting species. They will sprout off the root. If you cut a blueberry juniper off at the ground where there's no green limbs left, it'll die. Cut a red berry off or a mesquite off like that, it just sprouts back. So they've got to actually be grubbed out of the ground, uh, pushed out with a dozer or that track hoe and not broken off, but get the root and all out of the ground and that will kill that tree. There's still a lot of seeds that you'll have to fight. And maybe uh, in the future, you don't have to bring the bulldozer back, but you're going to have to spend time with a spray rig out there spraying chemicals on those young seedling mesquites. Yeah. The question about the Quail Masters group, uh, in, in the spring, I think in April of 2022, the first session of four sessions that the Quail Master group visits, goes to, uh, happens. So you can start Googling uh, Quail Master 2022, probably about the first of the year. Uh, if you're a member of the Texas Wildlife Association, it'll be advertised in their magazine widely, uh, every issue. So it's been two years since we've had one. So we're looking forward to having another Quail Master group. Um, 
you're interested in that, certainly uh, check up on it. Okay, and then one other person had a question about the Honey Creek and was wondering if that's the same as the uh, Honey Creek in Mason County, but I, I, I'm thinking not. Um, but. I'm not sure. This is on on the eastern side of Llano County and it flows east, southeast, so it may be. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, Mason County just to the east of Llano County? I mean, just to the west, excuse me. So maybe they are the same. Okay, those are all the questions that I saw. The, the I have a few more questions for okay. you. Um, related to the mesquite clearing, uh, a little bit of confusion here. Uh, Somebody has, Elizabeth McGreevy is asking about whether or not mesquite actually isn't a, a useful plant because it's a legume that's improving the soil biology. What do you have to say about that? Well, it is a legume. Uh, the roots go deep. They have drilled, uh, I mean, hand dug water wells 30 feet down. They have found roots of a tree. And the only tree, when they got back up out of the hole, looked around, it was mesquite. So it's deep rooted, it's pulling moisture and minerals from deep in the soil. But when mesquite gets so thick, it shades the ground and actually your warm season grasses die out. And the only grasses that'll be found in a, in a mesquite thicket mm. are plants like Texas winter grass that can grow during the winter time. So it's a uh, e economic uh, battle really. You've got to control the mesquite even though it does recycle nutrients to the surface. It's, it's actually harming the land uh, by covering up too much of the soil and uh, reducing grass cover. How, uh, Ricky, how can a person get started with improving their, uh, with restoring land? Is there any uh, specific ways or particular plants that you can use to get started? Well, the best way would be to first visit with several of the different agencies. Uh, the one I retired from, the Natural Resources Conservation Service is located, they have a field office in nearly every county in the state. Some, some locations might be serviced uh, two counties by one field office, but check in your county seat and see if there's a USDA, US Department of Agriculture, uh, NRCS office, contact them. They will come out on the land with you doesn't cost you anything. You've already paid their salaries with your taxes and they will advise you, look at your problem. You know, they'll advise you what, what's going on. They're not gonna tell you what to do, but they will tell you that if you've got mesquite, here's, there's chemical ways of controlling it. There's mechanical ways of controlling it. Uh, on small mesquites, very small, less than three feet tall, maybe prescribed fire would reduce mesquite. Once it's above three feet tall, fire won't uh, kill out the mesquite. So they'll give you those options. And then it's your choice to choose one of them or none of them. And there's even cost share available for on ranches. Uh, acre, one acre and up can apply. It's uh, really not for backyards, but for uh, small ranches to large ranches, you can apply to get cost share to do some of this work that would pay, you would pay for the work and be reimbursed about half of the cost. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife also has biologists that will come out on the land. Again, no charge, they meet with you. Um, county extension agents, Texas AgriLife, have got natural resource specialists that can come out and meet with you. I'm probably forgetting others. Uh, Texas, uh, the Hill Country, uh, the one that Daniel works for, I'm forgetting the name of the group right now, may have people that can come out. I Hill think Country there are even, Alliance, yeah. I think there's even some of the, uh, nature areas that have people that are trained to go out and look at land with people and give them advice on what to do. Sort of like citizen scientists going to uh, going to your property, helping you out. Well, these people come out even if you have like five or 10 acres or do you have to have a thousand acres? No, no, any size property is, is they'll even come into town and, and give you advice, but the cost share is not gonna be available unless you've got an acre or more. But yes, five, 10 acres is fine. Um, they, they like to get out of the office. They wanna go and see the country and they get to see the good country and the bad country. They get to see good operators and bad operators. So they can help you maybe avoid going down the road of making a mistake uh, 
and spending a whole lot of money that's not going to accomplish what you want to do. And they can give you alternatives that will steer you toward the correct way of handling that problem. We did have a person who specifically asked who they ought to contact if they're in Johnson County. Johnson County is Cleburne. Um, I think that office is vacant right now because the district conservationist replaced me in Weatherford. Uh, I would contact the NRCS office in Forney, which is east of Dallas. The team leader is uh, over about six counties and Cleburne is one of those counties. So Glenn Lukey in the Forney NRCS office would be your contact. Great. Um, are there any other questions? I, I, have I missed any? I see someone posted a link to the Parks and Wildlife representative for uh, Cleburne. I'm not sure. Um, can't recall the fellow's name that might work that county. The one I'm thinking of is in Granbury, so I'm not sure if he works Cleburne or not, but Parks and Wildlife would also have someone. You can go onto the NRCS website and put in your county or your town and find a contact person, uh, an email and phone number for someone to contact. Parks and Wildlife has a website where you can go and find a biologist. That's the, that's the button you click, find a biologist, and you can find one that works your county. So uh, help's available. Go out there and, and take advantage of this. And Kay Jenkins uh, suggested that it might be Nathan Rains. Could be. Could be. Uh, that's all the questions I have or I see right now, Ricky. Uh, it's been a great presentation. Thanks very much. Well, I appreciate the honor to get to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for, for coming, too, and, and participating. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you all. So, uh, anything else? Any closing uh, comments, uh, Kim or uh, Meg? Um, Just watch for your uh, watch for your agenda to arrive in the morning for uh, Thursday's events. Right. And You'll get your agenda and. Meg will have that out at, I think, 7 a.m., Meg. Is that right? <laughs> That's correct, 7 a.m. And, and our, people, people keep asking about recordings. Got an, a, another one. The, all of the presentations are being recorded and will be available to registrants after the, pres, after the symposium. So uh, I guess we'll just get that to, the, to you in an email after, at that point. Anything else? If it's not too late, Ricky. I do. I did get one final question here that I missed uh, about uh, somebody who wants to know how to kill. I think it's pronounced bahia grass. Bahia grass. I saw that. Um, that's that grows a little south of where I traditionally worked, but it's another introduced grass that is uh, brought in for cattle grazing. I would imagine you'd have to treat it with Roundup. Uh, kill the plants and then probably till it for a couple of years during the summertime to try to plow up the seeds, the seedlings as they germinate. Another option, if you can find one, might be to take uh, shred it real short. And then if you can find an old time moldboard plow, these were the ones that broke the plains in the 1800s and they will turn the surface under about eight or 10 inches. So you're putting the seeds are in the top two or three inches, seven or eight inches down below the ground, and then turn right around in, in the winter, do this in the winter time and turn around and plant native grasses on top of it. Yeah. And that'll give you the best chance of trying to get rid of bahia. Best way to control bahia is don't have it in the first place, but it's already <laughs> too much for a lot of places. All right, well, I think that's all we have.